This will be our final video in the complex analysis series, and it's going to be about Ruscha's theorem. So we're going to go ahead and say the theorem, state the proof, and then do an example of why it's useful. So in orange here, I have the theorem. So it says, suppose f and g are analytic on an open set containing a piecewise smooth, simple closed curve gamma and its interior. Okay, so this is all normal stuff. We have two functions now, f and g, which are both analytic on some open set, which is a domain, uh, containing a piecewise smooth, simple closed curve gamma and its interior. So now the uh, statement is, if the modulus of f of z plus g of z is less than the modulus of f of z for all z that lie on that closed curve gamma, then we can say f and g have the same, they have the same number of zeros inside gamma, and you have to count orders. So um, before we go into the proof, let's just think about what this means. So this says that if you take the modulus of f of z plus g of z, and if that's always less than the modulus of f of z for every single curve on gamma, so let's draw a picture because that usually helps us. So uh, let's just say we have a complex plane and we have some curve gamma that meets all the criteria and it's like this. Here's our curve gamma. So if f and g are analytic on some open set containing this gamma, let's just say, again, we have our domain in uh, green here. Let's just say this is our domain, everything inside there. So it's analytic on everything inside the green domain. Um, and we have this gamma. Then we say that if f of z plus g of z modulus is less than the modulus of f of z everywhere on this gamma, okay, so we're only concerned on the gamma, on the curve, uh, then we say that the f and g have an equal number of zeros inside gamma with orders. And remember that orders means that, for example, let's say f of z has a zero at, uh, let's say, z equals zero, but it has an order of that zero is, let's say, order equals four. So this is an O for order. Let's say the order of that zero is equal to four. Then uh, we say that g of z also has four zeros, but that you can have it in a different way. For example, if g of z has zeros uh, at z equals one, two, three, four, this is still met because even though z only has, even though f only has one zero at zero, the order is four and g has all four of these zeros. And as long as their order is each one, you just have to add up the orders and make sure those are the same. Okay. So we'll see uh, an example of that when we do our example. So let's go right into the proof. So this is a pretty simple proof, and um, it just starts like this. So since we know that modulus f of z plus g of z is less than modulus of f of z, we say we can say that g of z is not equal to zero on gamma, and f of z is not equal to zero on gamma. And uh, this is simple to show. Pretend g of z were equal to zero on gamma, right? So then this g of z at some point would go away. And for that point on gamma, we would have modulus f of z is less than modulus f of z. But that's impossible because something can't be less than itself. So g of z can never be zero on gamma. Now, why is f of z not allowed to be zero on gamma? If f of z were zero on gamma at any point on gamma, then at that point, we would have uh, just modulus g of z is less than, and since this is zero at that point, less than zero. And modulus can never be negative. So it can be zero, but it can't be negative. So because of those two statements, we can say that g of z and f of z are never zero on gamma. They're always, they always have some value, uh, non-zero value. Okay, so next we're gonna have a define a new function, h equals g over f. So now we take this statement and we're gonna divide this statement uh, all the way through by modulus f of z. And on the left side, we get modulus f of z over modulus f of z, which becomes a one. And in the uh, this part of the fraction, we have modulus g of z over modulus modulus f of z, which is we defined as h, and on this side we have modulus f of z divided by modulus f of z, which is 1. Okay, so this is um, this is just a restatement of this in terms of h instead of f and g. So now this is very important. Note this inequality uh, right here. This is kind of telling us where the range of h lies. So again, this is true for all z is on gamma, okay? So we what are the statement I've written down here is, so all output values of h of z on gamma lie in the disk of radius 1 centered at negative 1. So let's confirm that. This is indeed a disk, right? And this disk is centered where? This disk is centered at negative 1. And the radius is what? The radius is given by this number right here, 1. So uh, let's just see this graphically so it makes more sense. So what I've drawn the picture right here, this is the disk centered at negative 1 with radius 1. So uh, this, this inequality right here is telling us that no matter what uh, the value of h of z is, it always obeys this inequality right here. And is that true for everything on this disk? Well, pretend you pick something that's really, really close to this origin right here. So I'm going to uh, kind of give you a zoomed in view. So let's go ahead and uh, draw a zoomed in view. Pretend this is... Uh, so this is going to be, and we're going to pick, we're going to pick a value that's right here, right, really close to that boundary. Now, if we go ahead and we uh, add, if we add one to that, where's that going to put us? Since it's right before the origin, after we add one, it's going to be right before the value of one. And then what we do is we're supposed to take the modulus of that. What's the modulus of that? Well, it's a distance from the origin to there, which is just short of one. And is that true? Yes, just short of one. And we see that if we choose any other h besides that one, we choose anything back here, it's going to be even more true because pretend you choose uh, an h that's right here.
here, for example. So that would be your H, and then you're going to add 1, right? So it's, it's not going to go that far. It's going to go right here. And then you want the modulus of this, which is just the distance from uh, the origin to that point, which is going to be less than 1. So we see that this inequality for H defines that circle centered at negative 1 with radius 1. Um, alternatively, another way you can think about it is if you had just H of Z, if you had just this H of Z is less than 1, that's, that's obvious to see that that's a circle. That means the range of H is restricted to the circle centered at 1. But when you do H of Z plus 1, what that does is, and you put that less than 1, what that does is you shift all of these, you shift every point on the circle back by negative 1. So now it's centered at negative 1, and you have the same circle here, um, centered at negative 1 with radius 1, so that if you take any of these points on this new circle and you add 1 to them, you're going to get points on the original circle. And then when you take the modulus of these points in the original circle, those are less than 1. So that's another way you can think about that. So uh, we convince ourselves that that is indeed the circle. Um, so the important thing is that h of z has no change as z goes along gamma, because let's see what that means. That's uh, z is going to go around gamma, right? So z is going to start somewhere, and it's going to trace its way uh, all around gamma. But we see that h of z has no change. And why is that? Because let's just do a little experiment. Let's say we start at the gamma right here on the real axis. So let's say h also starts somewhere on the real axis. So let's choose a color. Let's use orange for this. So let's say h starts right there. Now, on uh, we move a little bit along gamma. And where's h going? Remember, h can't go anywhere outside this disk right here. So h maybe goes up here somewhere. Now, where does h go after gamma moves a little bit further? Maybe h goes down here. Maybe it goes down here. Whatever h does, it's all restricted into here. And we know that the starting point and the initial point of h of z after we go along gamma is the same. So if we draw a little bit bigger disk, pretend this is the disk that H is um, restricted to, and say H starts here, it can do whatever crazy things it wants as long as it ends up back at the starting point. But what is the angle at the starting point and ending point? So what was the angle right there at the starting point? Well, measured from the real axis right here, it's going to be pi, because you're going to go all the way around, and you're going to be at pi, right? Now, what's the angle at the ending point? The angle at the ending point must also be pi, and let me just prove that to you. So let me once again draw a... Um, a disk. So this is disk that uh, H will be uh, restricted to, and let's say that it starts here. Let me draw something less crazy just to see. So let's pretend that uh, it starts going up. Now, what's happening to the angle? So the angle is going up here, which means the angle is being reduced. It's getting reduced to something less than pi. Now maybe it goes down here. Now angle is something greater than pi because it's down here, and then the angle goes back up. Now it's something less than pi. Notice that the angle only changes. It only increases if you're moving in the counterclockwise direction. When you start moving in the clockwise direction, it starts decreasing. But whatever is happening in the end it has to end up back here. So that means that it's gone up some, it's gone down some, but the net up cancels with the net down to make it that you didn't have any change at all. Because if you're going to have change in the angle, then the values of h of z must be able to pass beyond this disk. They must be able to go beyond in this direction or this direction so they can have some net change. But since they don't and they end up at the same point, then there is no net change in the end. So just to kind of hammer this point in, pretend that we allowed h of z to have more of a range. Pretend its range was on this disk centered at 1. Then it could have a net change because if it starts here, then it could loop around as many times as it wanted and you could just keep increasing by 2 pi, 2 pi, 2 pi. But can you do that when the disk is centered right here and you are restricted to this disk right here? In fact, you can't because you start somewhere and then you start making some net change, but then you're eventually forced, even if you go as high as possible, you're eventually forced to come back down and come back to your starting point in some fashion. And since you can never pass this blue disk, you can never actually get net change. And that's why the net change as h of z uh, goes along, as uh, z goes along gamma of h of z is going to be zero. Now that's very important because remember the argument principle told us that the number of zeros of some function h minus the number of poles of some function h equals a net change. And the net change is zero, so that means the number of zeros of h equals the number of poles of h. But the number of zeros is h of, of h is what? So h we said is g over f. So the zeros, its zeros come from when g is zero. Its poles come from when f is zero. So again, number of zeros of h and gamma equals number of poles of h and gamma. And number of zeros of h, and that comes from, we said, g. So really this should be over here. So that means the number of zeros of g and gamma is equal to the number of zeros of h and gamma because zero because g is what generates all those zeros of h. The number of poles of h and gamma, what generates those poles again? We said that was f. So that means that the number of poles of h and gamma is equal to the number of zeros of f and gamma because whenever zero whenever f is zero, that means uh, h has a pole because f is the denominator of h. Okay? So that means that this is equal to this and this is equal to this. That means the number of zeros of f in gamma is equal to the number of zeros of g in gamma. And we have proved uh, Rouchet's theorem. Now let's go ahead and do an example. So this is used to solve kind of problems like this. So example is how many zeros does z to the power of 4 minus 2z minus 2 have in this analyst? Analyst with the lower radius is 1 half and the upper radius is 3 halves. So well, let's think about this. First, let's see how many zeros does this function have inside. So let me draw a picture. 
So the lower radius here is one half. How many zeros does it have inside that little disk, inside that little circle? So inside that little circle, what's the gamma we're gonna use? The gamma is pretty obvious. It's gonna be modulus z equals one half because that is the uh, equation of the inside ring. So now we have f of z equals z to the power four minus two z uh, minus two, and we're gonna have g of z is gonna be just positive two. So just a constant number. So now we're gonna do f of z plus g of z, right? So if we have this plus this, this negative two will cancel with this two. And we'll just have modulus of z to the power 4 minus 2z. And remember, when we have a sum or difference of moduli, we can split it up, and this will always be less than or equal to the sum of that. And that's um, by the triangle inequality. So we're going to split it up, and we're going to have less than or equal to the modulus of z to the power 4 plus 2 times modulus of z. And modulus of z, we said, was 1 half. So 1 half to the power of 4 is 1 16th, and 2 times uh, 1 half is 1. So we have 1 plus 1 16th, and that's always less than 2, because 1 plus 1 16th is less than 2. And 2 is what? 2 is the modulus of g of z. So you kind of have to do some uh, thinking here. Think of what you want your g of z to be uh, to make this inequality true. So we have that modulus f of z plus g of z is less than modulus g of z, which means that inside our gamma, uh, we have that the number of zeros of g is equal to the number of zeros of f. And how many zeros does this constant function have inside uh, our modulus z equals one half, well it doesn't have any zeros at all. So that means that f of z also has no zeros at all inside that little disk. So inside the little disk we can say it has zero zeros. Okay, now what about uh, the upper disk? So the upper disk, we're going to choose a new set of f and g. So uh, we're going to have that f of z is going to be equal to z to the power 4 minus 2z minus 2 in the upper disk. And we're going to have g of z is negative z to the power 4. And you'll see why we made that choice in just a second. So again, the uh, upper disk is given by modulus z is equal to 3 halves. And we want to see how many zeros it has inside this uh, disk right here. So when we have modulus of f of z plus g of z, we're going to have this z to the power 4 cancel with a negative z to the power 4, which is exactly why I picked this why I wanted that. And we're just going to have negative 2z minus 2 modulus. And again, using triangle, triangle inequality, we're going to take the uh, modulus of negative 2z plus the modulus of negative 2. So it's going to be 2 modulus z plus 2. And modulus z is what in this case? It's going to be 3 halves. So 3 halves times 2 is 3 plus 2 is 5. Now, is 5 less than the modulus of g of z? Well, modulus g of z is what? It's going to be uh, modulus z to the power of 4. And modulus z, we said, is 3 halves. And 3 halves to the power of 4 is 81 16th which is just greater than 5. So that means that uh, these, this right here, the modulus of f of z plus g of z, is in fact less than modulus g of z, which means g of z and f of z have the same number of zeros inside this new gamma, which is, uh, this new gamma is modulus z equals 3 halves. And g of z, which is negative z to the power 4, has how many zeros inside of that? Well, this, obviously, we see the zero. It only has one distinct zero at zero. So if we plug in zero here, then this equals zero. But what's the order? Again, the order, you pull off the x Component. So the order is 4. So don't forget to count orders because now what we know is that since g of z has four zeros inside of this new gamma right here, that means f of z, this function that we're actually dealing with, also has four zeros inside that gamma. So this has four zeros inside of uh, the big disk, the big uh, circle, and it has how many zeros inside the small circle? Zero. So let's just draw a final diagram. Let me draw it right here. So we say that inside the small circle, how many zeros does it have? None. Inside the big circle, how many zeros does it have? Four. Which means that all four of those zeros must lie inside this endless domain. Can they lie inside that small circle? No, we found that it has no zeros in there. So they must all lie within this big circle because none can lie within that small circle. They're forced to lie in the area in between. And furthermore, last statement is how many zeros does this have right here? Well, by fundamental theorem of algebra, we know that uh, if a polynomial is the power of n, then it has at most n zeros. And since we're dealing with complex analysis, it will have n zeros. Okay, so since this is a polynomial, polynomial to the power of four, it can have at most four zeros. And actually we have found all of them. So we're counting multiplicities, counting orders here. So actually answering this question, how many zeros does z to the power of four minus two z minus two have in the analyst uh, given by this? It has all of its zeros, all four of its zeros in there. And that's something very powerful that Rouchet's theorem allows us to do. It allows us not to only calculate the amount of zeros in some region, it allows us to calculate the number of zeros between regions and get more specific. So um, with that, we will conclude the uh, series in complex analysis, and hopefully it has been instructive. Hopefully uh, it cleared up some misconceptions, and um, until the next series.